In this video, we'll start to solve a linear algebra problem involving a complex traffic network. We have a bunch of streets and we want to investigate the traffic within this network. We'll do so by applying what's essentially the civil engineering analog of KCL. If you recall, KCL states that at a junction of a circuit, the sum of the currents entering the node must equal the sum of the currents exiting the node. Keep in mind that KCL is a statement on conservation of energy. Recall the physical processes and mathematical modeling lecture. There's a table in the Vic textbook that basically has a bunch of equations with the same structure, just applied to different contexts. One really cool aspect of engineering is that all branches of engineering use the same first principles, such as Newton's second law and conservation of energy. Therefore, all of the equations you'll encounter will have a pretty similar structure, but the variable names will be different to conform to field-specific syntax. Going back to KCL, we say that the currents in must equal the currents out. In this traffic network problem, we basically say the same thing. The number of cars going into an intersection must equal the number of cars leaving that intersection. This is also a statement on conservation of energy, but we use cars as the conserved quantity instead of current. Anyways, that's just my mini philosophical tidbit about engineering. Now let's go back to the problem. One really important detail that's omitted from the problem statement entirely is that every street is one lane and one way. For example, all the cars on Orange Street drive in one lane heading westbound. This will help us when applying conservation of, let's call it cars, at each intersection. We see that someone went out and collected the traffic volume in a one hour window during rush hour. They probably set up a camera at each intersection, recorded for an hour, and then manually counted the cars passing by. This is actually quite common in the field. I speak from my own experience doing exactly this during one of my internships. Anyways, the first entry states that 80 vehicles entered Grape Street East in the one hour long window and 30 vehicles exited. We just talked about conservation of energy, or more appropriately conservation of cars, so you might find it odd that there are more vehicles entering than exiting. But not every car that enters Grape Street East stays on Grape Street East. For instance, some cars could turn onto Pear Street. There are two odd entries. One of them is a question mark, and the other is NA. Part A wants us to investigate the NA entry. If we look at the network, we can see that every road except Apple Street starts or leads to some road further outside the network. For instance, 40 cars enter Orange Street from somewhere outside the network and 75 cars leave Orange Street to some unknown place. Even though we don't know the origins or destinations of the cars, we know for sure that 40 vehicles come and 75 vehicles go. If we look at Apple Street, the cars lead to an unknown location. But in order to drive onto Apple Street, you have to either come from Grape Street or Orange Street. In other words, to enter Apple Street, you have to come from a road within the network. There's no direct road from outside the network leading to Apple Street. That's why this entry is NA. Part B relates to the question mark in the table. Basically, it wants us to find the number of cars exiting Grape Street West. We can apply conservation of cars to not only one individual intersection, but the network as a whole. The total number of incoming cars must equal the total number of outgoing cars. If we sum across the first row, treating the NA more or less as zero, we have 235 cars coming in. If we sum across the second row, we have 230 plus X cars going out, so that means this entry must be 5. Now we get to the meat of the problem. Fruit Village wants us to determine the number of cars in the blocks between intersections. For example, we need to find the value of X which is the stretch of Orange Street between Apple and Pear Street. This is where we have to apply the so-called conservation of cars to each individual intersection. Keep in mind that every street is one way and one lane. It's evident that there are a lot of blocks between intersections, so we'll have to apply conservation of cars a lot. Eventually, we'll end up with a bunch of equations and a bunch of unknowns, so we form a linear system. Let's move to a more organized environment. I made a table to help keep us organized. It contains the list of intersections in the network and a space where we can write the equation relating the number of incoming and outgoing cars. The lower picture is copied from the problem statement and has the list of street names. The upper picture introduces seven variables, I1 through I7, which represent variables holding the unknown number of cars within each block. I'm using I since we're using a current analogy here, so we might as well conform to circuitry terminology. We also have the number of incoming and outgoing cars on each street, copied from the table on the first page of the problem statement. Before we do any math, we should think through some of the logistics. The upper diagram indicates that we have seven unknowns, 
but the table only has six rows of intersections. That means we have more unknowns than equations, so our system will be underdetermined. In other words, one of the variables will be free and the A matrix will not be square. Because the A matrix is not square, we cannot invert it to solve for the unknowns. We also cannot use the backslash operator because it does something different when you provide a non-square A matrix. Let's worry about how to solve it once we get there. For now, let's actually assemble the A matrix. The first row of the table is filled out in the example in the problem statement, so I copied it here and changed X and Y to I1 and I2, respectively. If we look at the intersection, we have I1 cars going in because the cars on Orange Street drive to the left. We also have 65 cars coming into the intersection from the north. I2 cars leave the intersection to go south, and 75 cars also leave the intersection to go west. All in all, we have I1 plus 65 cars going in, and I2 plus 75 cars going out. We basically repeat this process for the rest of the intersections. Let's look at the Grape West and Pear intersection. There's I2 coming in from the north, and I4 coming in from the east. There's I5 vehicles leaving down here, and another 5 vehicles leaving west. This means the equation for this intersection is I2 plus I4 equals I5 plus 5. Note that this 5 is the quantity we solve for in part B. If we go down to Grape East and Pair, we have I5 and 80 vehicles going in, and I7 and 70 vehicles coming out. For Grape East and Apple, we have I7 going in, and I6 and 30 going out. For Grape West and Apple, we have I6 and 50 going in, and I3 and I4 going out. And finally, for orange and apple, we have I3 going in and 40 going in as well, and then we have I1 and 55 both going out. Now that we've derived the equations, let's form the A, X, and B matrices. Remember that A is non-square. Specifically, it's 6 by 7 because we have 6 equations and 7 unknowns. The x vector is 7 by 1 because of the 7 unknowns, which means that the b vector is 6 by 1 since we have 6 equations. The dimensions also work out. a is 6 by 7 and x is 7 by 1, so the product of a and x will yield a 6 by 1 vector. Filling in the a matrix is just a matter of rearranging terms. For the first equation involving the orange pair intersection, I'll move the I2 over to the left and group all the constants on the right. If you multiply out this row by the x vector, you should get the right equation. Now let's do the rest. If you did this on your own, you may end up with some equations in a different row. You also could have flipped the minus signs throughout a row. For instance, you might have made this one negative, this one positive, and this negative 15 positive 15. This is okay as long as you check to make sure the matrices multiply out and you obtain the original equations we derived. In the next video, we'll put all this in MATLAB and solve the system. See you next time.